Okay, I think it's just about time to start. It's, uh, um, I'm uh, George Willis, I'm the uh, chair of the session, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Alejandra back to Australia, even if only virtually. Uh, Alejandra um, held several postdoctoral positions in uh, Europe and Australia, and uh, is now based at the, uh, uh, based in Madrid. Um, she has worked in several areas related to group theory, including uh, self-similar groups and, and growth in groups. And uh, today she's going to tell us about simple groups of homeomorphisms of Cantor space. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers at UWA uh, for, for putting all of this together and inviting me to speak. Uh, and, and it's really, really great to be to be back in in Australia, even even if it's just virtually. Um, but I mean, I would I would much prefer to be to be there in person. But at least this way, I don't have any jet lag. So you know, silver linings. Okay, so um, I've, I'm going to tell you about an ongoing uh, project that uh, started when I was at the University of Newcastle and, and it's something that I'm working on with uh, Colin Reed, who's still at Newcastle and David Robertson who uh, also moved away uh, and it's indeed about um, finding simple groups uh, that act on Cantor space. I'm going to try and keep it uh, accessible uh, at least at the beginning. Uh, at some points I might get a, a bit more technical but there'll be points at which you can um, come back in and I'll tell you when those when those are. All right, so here we go. So, um, so I'm a member uh, of the of zero dimensional dot group, uh, which is a great a great name for a website. And this is the website of the of the zero dimensional symmetry group uh, at at Newcastle. Uh, and there I am. That's 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 me. Um, and, and a whole bunch of us at, at Newcastle caring about um, zero dimensional symmetry groups. Uh, and what, what on earth are zero dimensional symmetry groups where they're essentially groups of automorphisms of locally finite graphs. This is essentially what we're going to care about today. So I've drawn uh, here some examples of locally finite graphs um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about their um, automorphism groups or at least things that act on them. So for this first example on the left, uh, you can it looks like a K, like a like a complete graph, K4 graph, but I'm actually thinking of it as a as a three a three simplex, three simplex, and its group of automorphisms is is S4 because I can take every vertex to every other vertex and it doesn't really matter what um, and, and and all the edges will will follow, uh, and it's got a and it's got a group of orientation preserving symmetries which is which is A4. Uh, and if I did this for a bigger for a bigger simplex, um, then then this orientation preserving subgroup would be simple. Um, but but okay, so there's there's some restrictions about doing things in two D in in two D paper. Um, this is the Fano plane. The next picture is the Fano plane, and its group of automorphisms, uh, or at least something that acts on that, it's PSL two seven, and that's also a simple group. Um, the next picture is um, at least part, it's only a finite part of what's supposed to be an infinite object and it's uh, an, an infinite three regular tree. So that's uh, every, every vertex here has got uh, three neighbors and we keep doing that forever and ever more. Um, and of course that has got a group of automorphisms, so that's ought t. And the picture on the right uh, is a picture of an, a part, a finite part of an A2 affine building, uh, which somebody very generously posted on, uh, I think it was Stack Exchange or Stack something. Um, they ge very generously posted the code to produce this picture. So that's, that's great. Um, and its group of automorphisms, or at least the label preserving automorphisms, if I'm not mistaken, so this is this is SL3 uh, QP, uh, and that's also quite close to being to being a simple a simple group. Okay, and so inside OT we've got OT plus T, which is the subgroup of 
orientation preserving automorphisms of the tree. So what is an orientation preserving automorphism? Well, you can give you can give your tree an orientation, which is essentially just drawing arrows randomly on, on every edge. And that will tell you, you know, in which direction is flow going if you want or how, how things are oriented. And for this odd plus T, you're not allowed uh, to change the orientation, meaning you have to preserve the direction in which the arrows are pointing. So that means in particular that you're not allowed to flip to flip an edge. Uh, okay, so this odd plus t is a subgroup of index two in in odd t, and this thing turns out to be also a simple group. Uh, and it it takes a little bit of work to show that it's simple. It was proved by Jacques Tietz in the 1970s, I believe. Um, and this is the sort of example that we're going to care about in in our talk. Um, right, so let me tell you about, let me tell you about, let me tell you more about OT. So I said that this is a, a zero, a zero dimensional group. Okay, so this says something about topology. I need to tell you why this is a topological group. So let's start off with the most, uh, the most basic thing. So how would you define uh, an automorphism of, of a tree? If I give you a finite chunk of a tree, um, incidentally, I got this, I took this picture from uh, the tree drawing tool from the zero dimensional dot group website and you can you can have fun drawing drawing trees and exploring this uh, this this is still um, I believe in in progress this this um, visual visualization project but I think it's great you can even choose you can even get it to show you automorphisms of these finite chunks and and watch it go Whee! It's even got a little animation. I'm so happy about this. Um, okay, so how do you define how do you define an automorphism of of this of this infinite object? Well, much the same way that we did in this picture. What you have to do is say, well, let's say I have to tell you what this thing is doing to vertices, right? So let's say I've chosen to fix this vertex v, right? Because that's very convenient for my picture. And then I will say something like. Well, maybe, maybe I will, um, maybe I will do this rotation type thing where I uh, I rotate the vertices next to next to V around, and then I have to tell you, okay, so what happens to the neighbors of those? And, and now I've got now I've got many choices, right? So I could take this vertex down to that one, which means I have to take that vertex down to that one. And now I've got, and now how about that, this vertex, I could take it maybe uh, further away to there, and I could take, whoops, no, not there. That's too far away. Uh, I could take this one uh, to here and that one to there, and the same thing for the, for the other two remaining ones, right? So I have to tell you, I have to tell you on a larger and larger ball what my automorphism is doing. And in much the same way that we define real numbers by giving uh, better and better rational approximations, better and better decimal expansions of a real number, we're going to define an automorphism by giving better and better approximations on finite balls. Okay, so what is an approximation and, and how, do you, how do you in the limit get to the uh, automorphism that you care about? Well, you, you have a topology, right? This gives you a topology. So the topology that this gives you is called the permutation topology, and it's exactly what I just said before. So two two automorphisms of the tree will be close to each other, will be in the same uh, will be in the same open subset if they do the same thing to to a large ball, to a ball of uh, large radius like that one. Okay, and it turns out that this topology is totally disconnected and locally compact, forevermore abbreviated to TDLC. And this is also known as zero dimensional, hence the name of the research group. Because it, it sounds cool to say that, that we study zero dimensional things. Uh, and it turns out that uh, group multiplication and inversion are continuous operations with respect to this topology, which is, which is great. Uh, okay, so if you, you've got two two things that uh, two things that were um, right, you've got two uh, two pairs of automorphisms that were close to each other, and you multiply them together, then the resulting pair will still be close close to each other. 
Um, okay, so this means that the automorphism group of the tree is uh, a TDLC group, and it's and it's not discrete, right? Um, because it's because it's uncountable. It also turns out that there's a compact subset of our automorphism group of the tree uh, that generates the whole automorphism group. And in this example, we can take the stabilizer, we can take the stabilizer of some vertex V. So this is actually the example I gave of an automorphism is already something that stabilizes V. And it's enough uh, to add some edge inversion, which I've labeled SE for um, S for reflection. In, in, all, in a lot of books to do with uh, Coxeter groups and things like that, S is used for reflection, and uh, I think it comes from the German uh, Spiegelung. Um, anyway, it turns out that you only need these this this big compact subgroup, the stabilizer of a vertex, and this edge inversion to give you all the automorphisms of the tree. And why is that? Well, because uh, I can conjugate by something in the stabilizer of V to take uh, to take this edge. Uh, inversion to this other edge inversion, or maybe to this other edge inversion. And once I flip that, once I flip along an edge, then I will have taken V to this new vertex, and I can play the same game, right? I can now rotate around this new vertex and conjugate the edge inversion to the other edges next to V. And so on, and, and this way, by multi by conjugating and and keeping and keeping doing rotations around the new vertices that I arrive at, I will obtain all of the automorphisms of the tree. <laughs> okay. Um, as I said, odd plus t is the orientation preserving automorphisms. It's a subgroup of index two, uh, and it's and it's simple. So because odd plus t is something. Is, is something of index two in naught t, then it's a, it's a closed subgroup. Um, and so it's still a TDLC group, which is not discrete. It is still compactly generated uh, because the same way that a finite index subgroup of a finitely generated group is finitely generated. Uh, and in fact, in here, we can take the same, the same, almost the same set, the stabilizer of a vertex, and instead of an edge inversion, we could do uh, a translation along along this edge, um, and it's uh, topologically simple. In fact, it's even simple on the nose, as I said before. And topologically simple means uh, no no closed no closed normal subgroups, except for the unavoidable ones. Okay, so this tells us this gives us a class S, um, calligraphic S. Um, that we're interested in of simple, simple zero dimensional groups that are also compactly generated. Okay, and because we're group theorists, we like to, we like to classify things. So the question is, can we classify these things? Um, so let's take inspiration from the classification of uh, finite simple groups, CFSG, and let's wonder whether there's a, what is this? There's the classification, this is the classification of uh, TDLC groups, non TDLC, non-discrete, compactly generated, topologically simple groups. Uh, that's quite a mouthful. Um, okay, is there such a thing? Well, for the classification of finite simple groups, you can obtain these these beautiful, beautiful things that look like a periodic table um, of finite simple groups. Huge success of the 20th century, massive achievement that. That there is such a thing as a uh, an analog of a periodic table of finite simple groups, and then when, when I say that I do group theory, I can say to people, "Oh, these simple groups are like the building blocks, they're like the atoms of of symmetries," and people might think that I do something to do with chemistry. But it turns out that for the groups in S, uh, we're we're not really doing chemistry, we're um, or or physics, we're much more doing biology. Um, and we're not just doing biology, we're doing some, we're, it's like doing biology back in the 19th century or 18th or 19th century when we didn't know many things. We hadn't discovered, um, we hadn't discovered enough animals or enough plants. Uh, so I, I've chosen this picture of a, a monophyletic tree of life from the 19th century to show that this is more or less the stage that we're at. Why do I say that we're doing uh, that we're doing biology rather than chemistry? Because 
uh, it turns out that we can't classify these groups up to isomorphism uh, because there's a result by Simon Smith that uh, was published in 2017 that says that there are uncountably many uh, groups in S which are pairwise non-isomorphic. So there's no way, no hope that we're going to classify the groups in S up to isomorphism um, like for the finite simple groups. But there's still hope. Uh, so in um, a series of uh, papers, uh, Pierre Manuel Capras, Colin Reed, and George Willis uh, showed, among many other things, uh, developing a whole load of theory that this class S splits into five types. Okay, so we can at least try to do some uh, some sort of taxonomy or some sort of rough classification, like in the like in the Tree of Life picture. So it's more it's more of a taxonomy what we're aiming for, and so. Much like, um, I guess, biologists in the 19th century that went off into the jungle or went on a safari to look for new animals to improve their, um, their tree of life, we're going to go on a safari and look for more examples of groups in S to understand this, uh, this taxonomy better. Okay, so let me give you an example of the sort of creature that we're going to find in our expedition. Uh, so once we've understood what T, we're going to do, we're going to modify it a little bit. And here's, and here's how we're going to do it. This is another example of, of a group in S. So it's, it's an uncountable group. It's, it's simple on the nose. Um, and I'm going to tell you later how we give it a topology so that it's uh, TDLC and, and compactly generated. Um, so this is the, it's, it's A or T, the group of almost automorphisms uh, of the tree. I don't want to think of it in terms of almost automorphisms of the tree. I want to think of it as the piecewise full group of O T. What is the piecewise full group of O T? Well, it's the thing consisting of homeomorphisms of the, of the boundary of the tree, which is this, uh, right? The boundary of the tree is all the things that go off to infinity here. And, and it's homeomorphic to Cantor space. And so it's the homeomorphisms that you obtain by doing the following. You take a clopen partition of the can of Cantor space, of the boundary of the tree, for instance. You can take uh, the boundary of these subtrees that I've uh, numbered and, and colored. And you take, and you take um, the same number of elements of or T, and on each of those, uh, and, and on each of these clopens, you act by uh, the elements of ORT T. Uh, so on the green one, will act by some uh, tree automorphism and take it someplace. The same thing with the orange two and the blue three and the brown four. So we restrict we restrict our our automorphisms to these clopens, and then we say, okay, if we do all of these four restrictions together, if we stitch them all together, do we still obtain a homeomorphism of the boundary, right? Does it does it all fit in together? Do we do we obtain? Yes, does it all fit in together? Do we obtain a homeomorphism of the boundary? And if the answer is yes, then we uh, then we put this this stitching together this 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 homeomorphism G. We stick it in the bag of um, the piecewise full group of O T. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, so let's suppose let's let's say that um, on on one and on three we might do this uh, a rotation about v. So that means that the green one is taken to this thing uh, two edges away from v, and and there it is. Uh, the blue three goes uh, one to the to the left, and it's still at distance one from v. Um, maybe on four we'll do something else. Maybe on four we'll do a reflection about this this edge E. So where four was before, it will go to where three used to be, and, and that's there. And maybe let's do, on two we'll do something else. We'll do a translation along this red ray. So two will go one one edge along this, this ray, and, and here it is, one edge further away from, from B. Okay, and it turns out, if you if you think about it carefully, uh, having restricted all, all these all these things, I still I still obtain a homeomorphism of the boundary, right? Because uh, the boundary of one is is here. The boundary 
the boundary of two is, is somewhere there, the boundary of four is here, and the boundary of three is this whole thing. Um, so I've got, I've recovered the whole boundary, and I'm still doing a homeomorphism because what I did was homeomorphism on the parts. Uh, but it's not, so So it's an element of my piecewise full group, but it's not an automorphism of the tree. Why not? Well, it doesn't preserve the distance between vertices. For instance, uh, two and three used to be two edges away from each other, and now they've ended up three edges away from each other. So no automorphism of a tree will do that. Okay, more generally, uh, if instead of taking the automorphism group of a tree, uh, we remember that the automorphism group of the tree acts on the boundary of the tree, right? And that's Cantor space, that's the Cantor set. Uh, so instead of, or T, we'll take anything that acts on the Cantor set. And this is what I've tried to draw with this dotted circle. Uh, we'll take, and, and instead of, okay, and now we do the same procedure. We'll take the piecewise full group of our, of our group G, and this is the same thing. Okay, so we partition our uh, Cantor set into finitely many Klopin parts, on each of the parts, uh, we restrict some elements of our group G. And if it so happens that by stitching together all these partial homeomorphisms, we get a homeomorphism of the whole boundary, we'll say, okay, this is an element of our full group. Right, and we'll say that a group is piecewise full, piecewise full if it's equal to its own full group. Okay, these are, the, these are the groups that we're going to care about for the rest of the talk. Let me give you, um, let me show you that at least some of you know some examples already of, of full groups. One of them, uh, perhaps the, the, well, I don't know what came historically first. I don't, I'm, and I'm not sure who started to think about these groups in, from this point of view. But a famous example is the family of Higman-Thompson groups, BDK. So in my, in my picture here, uh, D is equal to three and K is equal to four. So I've got four copies of a three regular rooted tree. And how does this work? Well, I choose something of this sort. I choose uh, a finite uh, subtree hanging from the root V, and I'm and I'm choosing it. Um, I'm choosing a complete subtree, meaning that the boundary of the trees hanging hanging below it, the union of all these boundaries, is the whole boundary of the tree. And I, I'm going to, I take two copies of this tree and I do, and I choose a finite leaf set for, for each of them. So maybe I'll choose that for the other one. And, and I label the leaves, in this case, one up to six. And I'm gonna relabel the leaves in the other one. So maybe I'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. And what do I do? Well, I just take, I, I just take, okay, so here's the subtree rooted at the thing labeled one. I'm going to take it to the thing labeled one. And I'm going to remember all the all the addresses. I'm not going to do any any funny symmetries here. So actually here I'm just doing the identity. Uh, on, on five, let's take five. I'm going to take five to exactly where five is. So I'm actually shrinking it. Uh, and I'm still also going to remember uh, all the addresses of these rays coming down. So I'm not going to change any any of that. And, and we do this, uh, and we do this for all the the rest of the the leads. And it turns out, uh, okay, it's not it's not very hard to show, but I I don't have time to go into the details of it. That this this thing is is full. If you, if you think about it, if you restrict to um, um, the, yeah, doing 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 elements of V just on pieces will turn out to be the same thing as doing another element of V. Uh, if you instead of taking instead of taking V, you take uh, the whole group of say let's do this example the whole group of automorphisms of this rooted tree. Let's do that here. Um, then the full group of that, well, what, what can you do? Um, in, a, in, in the group of rooted tree automorphisms, you have to, you have to preserve uh, adjacency. Uh, and so that means that you have to preserve height, right? The, the, the distance from, from the root. But if you restrict, if, if you do these restrictions, then you, there's nothing stopping me from doing something that swaps uh, these two things on, um, so that I'll end up taking this this one uh, to there, 
but maybe maybe on this uh maybe on this subtree i'll take it maybe i'll want to take an automorphism that takes it here and maybe on this subtree here i'll want to do an automorphism that takes it there so that i'll end up taking uh, so that I'll end up taking this subtree here and that subtree there, and that will still be valid, and I will have broken the adjacency. Okay, so this gives me something like a direct limit of well, copies of the whole uh, automorphism of the of these rooted trees, um, except that they're being permuted by the whole symmetric group, the whole symmetric group on the on the corresponding level. Okay, so this is a huge this is a huge uncountable group, but it turns out that all three all three of these examples okay here that the one that i didn't talk about is um just remembering the the addresses instead of doing a rooted automorphism at each part uh, and this is a locally finite group it turns out that all three of them have a have a big uh simple subgroup um so for for v it turns out that it's its derived subgroup for for this uh for this locally finite group, instead of taking symmetric groups, you take alternating groups, so you obtain a simple subgroup. And the same thing here, taking alternating group instead of symmetric group. So this is a theorem, this is for a reason, and it's a theorem that I will explain later. Um, and so these, these uh, big sub simple subgroups, so full groups, have been a source of interesting simple groups in the last few years. And okay, so there are some important papers by people like Yushchenko and Mono and by Nekrashevich. So they gave the first examples of finally generated infinite simple groups with extra properties like being amenable or, or having every, every element of finite order um, and being also of intermediate growth. If you don't know what some of these words mean, then don't worry, it's not essential to the talk. Okay, so we found we found our spot in in our in our expedition. Here's where we're going to here's where we're going to spot all these new all these new species um, to add to our um, tree of life to our taxonomy of S. Uh, but first of all, I need to tell you how you put a topology on these things, right? If you notice, the examples I gave you were all finitely the, the examples of things I gave you were all finitely generated, and I actually care about things that are not discrete. So I need to tell you how. I need to tell you something about topology. Um, here's a little aside. If you choose the wrong topology, if you choose the most naive topology, so the same, the exact same thing that we did for, for ought T, which is to say that two, uh, two elements of the piecewise full group are close if they do the same thing on, on a ball of large radius, uh, you're, you're gonna get nowhere. Because if you choose that most naive of topologies, and you assume that the topology is uh, locally compact and that your group is piecewise full, then you will end up obtaining a group that is countable, locally finite and residually finite. And that's everything, that's the complete opposite of what we want. Um, and I'm mostly saying this, okay, so this is to advertise something that Colin and I did on, on the site. Um, but it turns out that there is, you can find the, the, right, the right topology. And how do we know this? Because somebody else already worked out that uh, the piecewise full group of ORT T, A or T does admit a non-discrete TDLC topology. And why why is it? It's because it preserves the opens of every stabilizer of a, of a vertex. What do I mean by preserve the opens? I mean that for every element of A or T and every, uh, every open of a stabilizer of a vertex, when I conjugate that open, uh, and I intersect it with my original thing, that's, that thing is still open. And so this, is, this, this tells us that we can induce, so we can induce the topology up from the topology in, on ORT T. So the opens, so the opens of, of A ORT T uh, will be translates, translates of opens of the stabilizers of V for V, a vertex of T. Um, so that means, in, in fact, so this means what? That this means that the new topology will be, will say that two almost automorphisms are close, not if, not only if they do, if they do the same, uh, not only if they agree on, say, a ball of large radius, but if the difference, um, so, so they'll have to, so there has to be no difference between what they do on a on a large ball, but also the difference what they do outside the ball has to be an automorphism of the tree. 
And that's the key difference. The difference has to be an, an automorphism of the tree. Okay. And it turns out that this has something, this has something very convenient. The, the, the opens, the opens of STV, um, have something very, very convenient. So they, they are what by definition, uh, let's say, let's say that this is V by definition, they are the, the fixators, the, the point wise stabilizers of, uh, subtrees that contain V. So here's a subtree. Oh, maybe let me choose a different color. Here's a subtree. Uh, here's a subtree that contains V. And that would be my A, A for tree. And this turns out to uh, decompose as a direct product of the rigid stabilizers of the subtrees hanging from the leaves of A. So that is the stuff that acts only on this pink bit on the, on the boundary of the subtree hanging from here. Um, on here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go crazy and choose, choose all the colors. Whoops, there's that one there. And here's another one, here's another one here, right? So we've got four rigid stabilizers and it turns out that you can stick all these direct, pro the, the direct product of these four things together is exactly all the things that uh, fix this subtree A point wise. And I was gonna explain why, why, this, why this works and the, and, but I don't actually have much time. So I think I'm gonna skip this part but the, the reason the reason why uh, this works, okay, so what do we have to show? We have to show that um, for every element, right, we have to show that for every, every element in our almost automorphism, um, when, we, when we conjugate ST, the stabilizer of V by this, by this G, this turns out to be, this turns out to be open. So in order for this to be open, it better contain uh, a basic a basic open so that means the fixator of some of some tree a and the reason we can do that is because we can say well what does g what does g do it takes all these it takes all these uh all these boundaries of subtrees to to somewhere else and so all that we need to do um is take the subtree the subtree a to be the one defined by uh the the the, the boundaries of the of the image Okay, so this is the this is the red bit, and because it's a direct product, you can basically do exactly what you want. You can basically do anything you want on on each of the parts and stitch them together, and still ensure that you end up with something um, that that you that you end up with something in in here. Okay, I wanted to explain that in a little bit more detail, but um, I don't think I have time for that. Um, so the point is, this works. Um, this this thing works. Precisely because these uh, fixators decompose as direct products, or in other words, uh, the direct products of these rigid stabilizer things are open. That's why this works. Okay, so this is why it works. So as mathematicians, we take we take something that we like and we give it a name, and we say, okay, let's let's go with this um, and see see what happens. So this property of having um, direct products of rigid stabilizers that are that are open is what we're going to call locally decomposable. So our our group our group G of homeomorphisms of the boundary uh, is going to have a locally decomposable topology if, however, we partition the boundary of the of the Cantor set into clopens, then the things uh, the the rigid stabilizers of things of, of things that only act on each part of the partition um, are basic identity neighborhoods, are basic opens. So uh, some examples, any discrete group will do this um, because, you know, in a discrete group, the, the, the singletons are, are open and, and everything, everything is open. So even if these rigid stabilizers are trivial, then they'll still be open uh, in a discrete group. So that's no use. Um, Anything acting on on T with um, T's independence property or property P, if you know what that means, um, or even any profinite branch group, whatever that is, also. So that's something that acts on a on a rooted tree, which is transitive on levels, and in fact, it already comes with um, locally decomposable action, right? So the the definition of branch group is something that where the 
dry products with rigid stabilizers on levels are, are open. If you don't know what that is, then don't, don't worry, I just gave you the definition. Um, Non-examples, abelian groups, things like ZP, because rigid stabilizers cannot be abelian and non-trivial at the same time. So what do we show? The first thing, uh, the first thing that we show is that it turns out that this notion, which we took and thought, okay, this is probably sufficient to get the topology that we want on a full group, turns out also to be necessary. So this is the right topology, and it's the only topology that we could have picked uh, in order to get a zero-dimensional group, in order to well, a, a TDLC, a TDLC group, uh, maybe with some extra some extra stuff. Okay, so the point is that suppose suppose we start off with some some G that uh, some G that acts on the Cantor set, and maybe we can chuck in something extra that also preserves the opens of G. Okay. Then the full group of that, the full group of, of this whole thing, can have a TDLC topology, uh, which makes the subgroup, the original subgroup G, open. So that is, we can induce a topology up from G, if and only if uh, G is locally decomposable. So it satisfies the star product thing. Okay, I've got some asterisks here. So it's TDLC plus, we're also assuming um, second countable. So that means that the, uh, the, the, the base of the topology is, is, is countable. That's a very reasonable assumption to make. Um, and it turns out that this is the unique, the unique topology that we could have chosen. If, if this happens, then this is the unique thing that um, both G and its full group admit. Okay, so topology is sorted, and it turns out that we need to restrict, our, if we want something, a full group that has a chance of being an S, then we need to choose things that act independently on, on parts, on, on, every, on every part of any Clopin partition of the Cantor set. Okay, if you got lost in all the topology, this is the time to come back. I'm going to talk about um, simplicity and why these things are compactly generated. Or if you want to, if you, if you still don't like topology, think of the analog of finally generated. Let me start with the examples I gave at the beginning. Let's think about alternating groups. So both uh, the Him and Thompson groups V, the family of Vs, and this big direct limit of uh, symmetric groups are both, in some sense, limits of symmetric groups. So for the second one, this is this is clear. Uh, for the first one, I, I'm not quite sure what the right notion of limit should be, but okay, you can think of it. It's a, it's a big, it's a big um, uh, putting together of symmetric groups. And they both have in common the fact that their derived subgroup is simple and it's formed of alternating groups. Um, Okay, so let's, here's the definition. We're going to do the exact same thing. Um, let's take something that acts on the Cantor set. And instead of thinking of the full group, we're going to define the alternating full group. What is this? This is the thing generated. Uh, this is the thing generated by the following stuff. So they're the things, uh, they're the things in the full group such that when you do your when you do your partition, uh, let's say like that, uh, the parts both at the beginning and at the end um, are the same. So you do the same. You act on the same partition. You preserve the partition, and all that you do is permute the parts around. Uh, so oh, actually, I don't want that. Is permute the parts around, and and the permutation that you do. Um, the permutation that you do is even. Um, yeah, so that's it. I don't need to draw any more arrows. Okay, so and it's the thing generated by those elements of the of the full group. So they preserve they preserve partitions, and what and the permutation that they induce on the parts uh, is is an even permutation. And you take all the elements of a full group of that sort and see what they generate, and this is the alternating full group. Think of it as you know, if you think of the infinite alternating group, this is the thing generated by all the alternating groups on finitely many uh, subsets, on, on finite subsets. Okay, it turns out that 
if the action of the group that you start with is sufficiently nice, the action is minimal, so that, that's, that's essentially topologically transitive, so it's a transitivity condition, uh, then this uh, alternating group is simple, on the nose simple. Um, okay, so if you start, so this minimality thing is equivalent to uh, acting transitively on levels of a rooted tree. So if, if, say, you started off with a profinite branch group, if you know what that is, then this theorem tells you that this alternating group is simple, and therefore it's, it's closure once we once we use the topology that I talked about before, it will be a topologically simple group. Okay, so this is how you obtain things that are simple. How about um, this? Um, oh, okay. So, th so there's a key idea for both of the things, both uh, simplicity and topological and, and compact generation or finite generation. And the key idea is the following. The full group is is what is the group of invertible elements of some bigger inverse monoid, which I'm I'm going to call B I G. It's Boolean inverse monoid, um, and it's a, an an inverse monoid of partial homeomorphisms of of the Cantor space. Uh, and what is it? So you take all the restrictions of G to clopens of the Cantor space, and this is the picture that we had before. Okay, so I've taken I've taken four restrictions. Um, to four clopens. Uh, so let's say I look at the I look at the green restriction that takes this green u1 to this green g1 of u1. Um, so that's an element of my of of big. How is it a monoid? Well, I compose I, I can compose partial homeomorphisms if you know uh, the 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 range. Of the first one that I do agrees with the domain of, of the of the second one that I want to do, and maybe I have to restrict uh, to to what they have in common. Okay, and then that means that I will have to restrict the the pre-image of the of the first one. I will have to restrict the domain of the first one to agree with the pre-image of of the thing that I'm restricting to. Okay, inversion is easy because it's a partial homeomorphism, so it's a it's a homeomorphism between two two clopins, and being a homeomorphism, of course, it has an inverse. And there's an extra. Uh, oh, that's the wrong, that's the wrong symbol. That should be, that should be this. There's an extra join operation, and that's stitching together two partial homeomorphisms. So I, I've in the picture I could have stitched together. I have in fact, I, I'm, I can stitch together what uh, G1 and G2 do together to the green and the orange. And, and that will still give me a partial homeomorphism. And so this F of G is exactly the, the group of fully invertible elements, meaning the things that are uh, complete, that are defined everywhere. They give a homeomorphism that is defined everywhere on the Cantor set. Okay, so we work with this bigger inverse monoid. Um, and it turns out that, um, Yes, and it turns out that this um, alternating full group is finally generated if and only if this Boolean inverse monoid, this bigger monoid, is finally generated. And by finally generated, I mean, okay, so we're allowing these extra operations now of, uh, and that's also wrong, of stitching together of things. So. Nekrushevic showed that if you've got uh, a group acting on the on on the Cantor space by homeomorphisms, and you start off, and, and the group that you care about is finally generated, and the action is expansive, whatever that means. So that means that um, that two that two elements that are that are different will end up being will end up being taken far apart. Um, if that happens, then the alternating uh, group of G is the alternating full group of G is finally generated, and so the idea is exactly what I said before. It turns out this is the this is the germ of the idea. Um, if your group G is finally generated and the action is expansive, this is the same thing as the Boolean inverse monoid. This thing of restricting um, G to to parts and maybe stitching together um, some of the partial homeomorphisms. If this thing is finally generated with respect to these um, two operations. And that turns out to be equivalent to the alternating group, full group being finally generated. Okay, but it, we actually wanted something to do with compact generation, right? This is, this is what other people have done, and this is how you get finite generation. 
uh, we actually have to deal with um, topologies. So we have to deal with topological inverse monoids, which is which is a lot of fun. Um, and what does it mean for something like this to be compactly generated? Um, and the details of this are for another talk. And in fact, here's the question: Why, why, why not start? You know, instead of with a group G acting on X, why not start with a monoid of partial homeomorphisms and and take the Boolean inverse monoid generated by that? Um, so you have something way more general. Okay, so here's the other theorem that we obtain. Um, Okay, so here's the, how, how we obtain groups in um, S. We'll take some group G, we'll act on, which acts on Cantor space, and the group G is, top, is, is a TDLC group, and with respect to that topology, it's compactly generated. There's a compact sub subset that generates everything. And the topology is locally decomposable, which means that the basic opens are big direct products. Okay, and the action is minimal, right? So this means that it's essentially transitive or topologically transitive on Cantor space. Then we get uh, these equivalences. So the action of G on Cantor space is expansive. So that's, uh, that's essentially if and only if this BIG is compactly generated. And that's equivalent to the closure of the alternating full group being compactly generated, but then it turns out that we can do some, we can use some theory um, of TDLC groups um, developed by um, Colin, George, and um, Pierre Manuel, and it will turn out that this is equivalent to A of G being compactly generated, so it turns out that this thing, that, that these two things are actually equal. So this, the point is that this A of G, so this A of G is actually a group in S that we care about. Okay, so I'm going to finish. Okay, here's a comment that if, if G is not a discrete group, then this alternating full group can never be amenable. So you can't use that to obtain new examples of amenable groups. But okay, if you don't care about amenable groups, then it doesn't matter. So here's a summary. How do you make your own group in S? How do you go on a safari um, and, and find a new example to put in your tree of life. Well, you start off with uh, with a group G acting on acting on the boundary of, of a tree or just on Cantor space and you forgot that it comes from a tree. You don't know where it comes from. Uh, make sure that it's compact and make sure that the topology is locally decomposable. So uh, the things the things that, uh, you know, these things that you form with direct products of things acting only on uh, on clopins uh, are big, are big subgroups. Uh, make sure that you have, chuck in something, chuck in some C that preserves the opens of, of G, and maybe make sure that the action of the, of the group that G and C generate is, uh, is, is minimal and is expansive. So this means that there will be maybe some translations. Apply the two theorems. Magic. You obtain you obtain a group in a group in S, um, something which is compactly generated, abstractly simple, and well, and, and the topology is um, TDLC. And the group that you will obtain is non-discrete if and only if what you put in is not discrete. I'm I've gone over time, and I apologize. So I don't have time to tell you in detail about examples. I'm just going to tell you something that we are thinking of. So these two slides are to show that, okay, we recover examples uh, that or have already appeared in the literature, even if they haven't appeared explicitly as piecewise full groups or part of this construction. Um, so we're fitting things into our bigger framework. Uh, but here's something that is still in progress, and this is a lot more fun, things that act on capillary sets. What is a capillary set? So here's a picture of an actual capillary uh, it's the stuff between arteries and, and veins, and, and, and look at all the look at all this this stuff, all of this branching out, but not quite branching out like a like a tree. So you've got lots of scope for things acting independently on all these little uh, sub arteries, but maybe they join together sometimes a little bit, but just enough to ensure that we have this independence that we were talking about. Um, 
okay, we don't actually want this this part. We don't actually want things to join up at the at the vein in the end. But okay, so we're looking at things almost automorphisms or full groups of things that act on on this sort of structure. Um, and and it looks like we can obtain a lot of examples from things that I've done on these sets. So um, I think I've said enough and I'll thank you for your attention.